Uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm very excited to have you all here for uh, day two um, of the Hannah Ensign Center Conference at Bard College, Why Privacy Matters. Um, again, I'm Roger Berkowitz. I'm the academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center. We had a great day yesterday, um, some really uh, exciting uh, presentations, interviews, talks, uh, exploring uh, the, the paradoxes and problems of privacy in, in, in the 21st century. Uh, we all say we want privacy, and yet privacy seems ever more tenuous and difficult to hold on to. And uh, I thought we had some just uh, thoughtfully searing inquiries into that dilemma yesterday, and that will continue today. Um, a couple of reminders. Uh, if you would like to uh, ask a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, but for those of you who don't want to do that or, or are watching on the inner web, um, you can tweet us at, at RN Center, and uh, we will be checking that. And if there are questions, we will try and include those in the conversation. And finally, if you want to just comment on it, the hashtag for the conference is RentCon2015. RentCon2015. And uh, we'd love you to participate in the conversation that way. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two of my uh, colleagues at Bard, two wonderful writers. Uh, I'm going to let them come up and, and actually introduce themselves, but I want to welcome to the stage uh, Wyatt Mason and Ann Lauterbach. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, and welcome back for those of you who uh, were here yesterday, and welcome for those of you who are joining us for the first time today. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to say a few remarks before I have the pleasure of having a conversation with Ann Lauterbach. I won't attempt to summarize yesterday's varied perspectives or modes of engagement with the subject that animates these days that we are fortunate to spend together. For my part, uh, I feel lucky that I will have the chance to interact with you after Anne and I have a chance to interact together. As I was thinking about having the chance to talk to Anne, I couldn't get out of my head an image that was used by one of yesterday morning speakers, David Brin. So before Anne and I talk, uh, I'd like to bring that image forward into today. Bryn suggested that we aren't going to be able to roll back the technological encroachments upon public life that we've seen emerge in the past century, and especially the last generation. Let that encroachment into public life be represented in our minds by the ubiquitous presence of cameras around us now, in our homes and on our street corners, in our vehicles, on their dashboards and on their back bumpers, and of course, the cameras that are in our pockets. To a respondent from the audience who suggested to Bryn that we need to try to put stays on the overreach by corporations and the government that look into our lives, that look into our search histories and sift through our phone calls and who knows what else or from my standpoint how, Bryn suggested that it will be impossible to stop that penetrating gaze of the powerful upon the powerful and the powerless alike. So here's the image that stayed in my mind from Bryn's remarks. Go down to the zoo, Bryn said. Climb into the baboon enclosure and try to poke a pointed stick into the eye of the biggest baboon. He won't let you. Elites won't let us blind them, he said. The idea being that it can't be stopped. But that image, it's quite violent, isn't it? One of great conflict, not even conflict between humans, but conflict between different species of creature, actually not even just species, different families and orders of creature, human versus ape, primitive combat, sharp stick and that tenderest of animal parts, the eye. 
It's inhuman, that image, it seems to me. And it seems to jar, at least as I understood it, with Brin's idea that humans, through what he called prostheses, which begin at the idea of, say, the eyeglasses that we began wearing 500 years ago, or even printed matter, which is a way of storing things that only resided prior to that in our minds, that human beings, Brin said, were evolving. That in fact the human species had nothing to fear from this evolution of technology because that evolution of technology was an enhancement, not a degradation. And yet this violent idea of conflict. I have to say I find that image of technological encroachment and the attempt to stop it to be not very agreeable, inhospitable to human life, and unpleasant. And it made me think of another image that was more congenial, but no less strange, perhaps. It actually made me think of 8,208 images, of which I can show you just one. I don't know if the lights can be dimmed a touch to give you a sense of what this image is. This is a film still. It's one of 24 frames that unscroll a second in a five minute and 42 second film called Charlotte, which was made in 2004 by a British artist whose name is Steve McQueen. It is a silent film. It is shot on film. And it seizes upon unceasingly the right eye of a woman, Charlotte, who we don't need to know is a famous film star, but is Charlotte Rampling and who was famous in part for having a set of eyes that was transfixing and unusual and that people wanted to get behind, imaginatively. For five minutes and 42 seconds shot through a red filter, McQueen stares at this tender, fascinating thing, the human eye. But he doesn't just stare. You'll see a shadow in the foreground before the eye. That shadow is a finger. It is the finger of the artist, McQueen, as he probes around this tender thing. He touches the eyebrow, he touches the eyelid, the thumb enters the frame, he pinches the tender eyelid, and we see that pinch leave a mark on the eyelid that slowly fades, but is there. Five minutes and 42 seconds of poking and probing and prompting and then this extraordinary thing happens. McQueen's finger, which had been happy just to touch at the skin, pushes further in and touches the ocular surface itself. It pokes this famous eye in the eye. The eye does not blink. Nothing terrible happens. The eye survives, the finger withdraws, the eye blinks, and then the film repeats. There are only three copies of this film in an era in which images from cameras have become ubiquitous and video has become the medium that everybody has everywhere all the time. You can't see this movie. I wish I could show it to you. But you can only see it in a gallery or a museum in its three copies. It is that rarest of rare things if not an original, a print of an original work of art. I am struck when I think of this image to think of Brin's idea of a stick in the eye of a baboon as being the way that we can manage to not manage the way in which someone might overpower us with their looking. We're fascinated by the fact that none of us has access to what is inside, behind the eyes of another person. We access, we access that through words in major part. As the critic Terry Eagleton calls us, we are language animals. Although there are many creatures on the planet that use language, we are only human, homo sapiens, the only creature that turns that language into a set of signs that we put on pages and we attempt to communicate absently through. The idea that there is a space behind the eye 
which needs to be protected, is a question that I wonder about. I wonder if that space needs protection. And I wonder about it because art, written art, visual art, spoken art, body art, is all a production of that space, that private space that each of us has and might try to share. Early in the remarks yesterday, our president, Leon Botstein, talked about the interdependence of the public and private life in Arendt's view of the way in which private life is essential so that it can serve public life and the role that art which is made in private, plays in the education of the individual who would have a public life. In an era in which, and in a conference when, we're talking about the ways in which privacy is being intruded upon, it's interesting to look at the role of the artist as someone who lives in some sort of privacy behind their eyes, but it's not a privacy that they guard in the same way that we might need to guard against someone else's a corporation's, a government's probes. How does the artist then remain open in a time when there is so much fear about being seen? Fear about being seen at the same time when we're all more readily than ever exposing ourselves to being seen. How an artist maintains a place where there can be meaningful production of art that could allow for a meaningful public life is a question that we today get to discuss with Anne Lauterbach, author of nine books of poetry, one collection of essays, and she's written extensively on the visual arts as well. Anne's work, its rigor, its clarity, has been praised enormously and fittingly, but most meaningfully by her peers, those writers who recognize in her work of capacity to communicate to us something which can only be found through the thinking one does when alone. So we're going to talk today with Anne about what it means to be able to do such a thing. So I'd ask you to welcome and Lauterbach. Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, persons, for being here. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm somewhat surprised to be here, since I think my main art, poetry, is something that is um, strangely absent from public discourse. Um, by way of an introduction, I wrote a few words down, um, and then I will join Wyatt and we'll have a conversation. So the words that I wrote down are actually a word chain that came out of my thinking about um, the word privacy and the chain of um, words that I personally affiliate with it and also came from some of the remarks that I heard yesterday. So solitude, anonymity, lonely, invisibility, interiority, subjectivity, autonomy, independence, agency, exile, Sanctuary, concentration, focus, duration, comprehension, silence, patience, reception, pausing, waiting, listening, thinking. Virginia Woolf was invoked yesterday, her a room of one's own. Gandhi was invoked, his radical indifference to privacy as such. 
I think of Rilke's letters to a young poet, which speak about solitude frequently, and famously says that it is the obligation of beloveds to guard each other's solitude, which I take to mean to be aware of the difference between one person and another, even or perhaps especially within intimacy. Marilyn Robinson writes luminous and lucid essays from a deeply contrarian perspective, and her ability to do this has a lot to do with her turning away from the frenzied environment of ostensible connectivity in which we live, and consulting instead her very considerable capacity to turn information into knowledge. This idea interests many of us, certainly it interests me, as the technosphere alters, as was also mentioned yesterday, our understanding of epistemology itself. It also threatens to disallow or consume the kind of oppositional thinking that might lead to oppositional actions, and the gathering together such action must elicit, although this aspect has in recent history proven to be less than simple from the rapture and rupture of Arab Spring to the Occupy movement. I don't think information is the same as knowledge. Knowledge is a word which seems to be dimming, eclipsed by something more immediate, more instant, more gratifyingly reactive. I think information is needed for knowledge, but I'm not sure how much or what kind. And I think the human capacity to interpret which for me is almost the same as our capacity to make meaning, is in some jeopardy. To interpret is not the same as to critique. I'm interested in how humans make forms as interpretive facts or acts. I do not think technology is a form, but a tool. And as Ben Wisner said yesterday, it is a neutral tool, neither good nor evil. How we use it in the forms we make will tell us finally about the times in which we live. Only its use has moral or ethical implications or consequences. I'm interested in how we think about the consequences of what we think, do, and say. Perhaps thinking about consequences is related to being aware of our private selves with a collective public, within a collective public. This relationship seems particularly compromised, even as it is everywhere exposed. We do without the eyeball. We can do without the eyeball. We can always do without the eyeball. So the title of this, this conversation is meant to be The Private Life of the Writer, which Anne told me upon uh, learning of the title that it was a misnomer. And so I want to read something from Anne's Extraordinary The Night Sky, which is Writings on Poetic Experience. And I'm going to begin with a quote that she quotes from, uh, from Mallarmé. And then I will switch to something that Anne wrote in response to it. <laughs> With Thus I won't be needed at all. <laughs> we'll start with Mallarmé. <laughs> with a glance, I shall gather up the virginal absence scattered through this solitude and steal away with it, just as in memory of a special sight, we pick one of those magical, still unopened water lilies which suddenly spring up there and enclose in their deep white a nameless nothingness made of unbroken reveries, of happiness never to be, made of my breathing now, as it stops for fear that she may show herself. Steal silently away, rowing bit by bit so that the illusion may not be shattered by the stroke of oars, nor the plashing of the visible foam, unwinding behind me as I flee, reach the feet of any chance walker on the bank, nor bring with it the transparent resemblance of the theft I made of the flower of my mind. Anne writes in response, there are times, this being one, late November, everything from air to hair turning gray, when a person wants to withdraw into a steady state of reception 
to become as mutely supple as a telescope scanning the night sky. I'm struck by that idea that of a person who would want to withdraw into a steady state of reception. Can you talk a little bit about a potential correspondence between that state of reception and what solitude might mean to someone attempting to think privately? It's an interesting correlation, isn't it? The idea, what are you receiving when you're, when you're in solitude? What is the reception space? Um, because reception seems to me very different from response. So it means a kind of, for me anyway, it means a kind of um, openness uh, to, or an awareness maybe even better, uh, of the, where one is in not only one's room, but in one's world. And receptivity is a, is a kind of, um, it's different from passivity. Uh, I think when we receive, um, we're preparing to respond. So there's some kind of correlation between um, the state of reception and the potential for accuracy or, or validity, I want to even say, of response. But I think without reception, <laughs> it's such a funny word now because it's like I'm not getting good reception. Um, so it's kind of moved over to some other space. But without a kind of personal capacity to receive in this sense, um, I think that our, we're not likely to respond accurately to what's coming toward us. Can I say that? But what do you mean by accurately? So what's the measure by which in solitude, when in a state of reception, different from in your remarks today, you, you, I think you used the phrase the gratifyingly reactive, the idea that you know if you tweet, you get a ping back or some sort of response instantly. Well, you know, we've, 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 I think there's been a lot of conversation even, even yesterday about the, maybe the difference between op- opinion and um, and judgment, something like that. So, I mean, judgment in the sense of actually, accuracy would be something like, well, I'm, lis- I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm trying to actually answer what you're asking me rather than what I think. <laughs> so I have to kind of um, suppress my own um, desire to assert what I already am thinking. So how we change how we think is by being receptive, right? Otherwise, we just go walk around with what we've always thought, and, and we're kind of unable to, to alter that. So if it's, if it's a fairly, con- if yesterday, say, in the mentioning of, of Wolf's um, A Room of One's Own, was Wolf writing about the same thing that we would need to talk about now as writers attempting to find that space in which one could receive and then at one's right moment respond? Is it a different conversation 100 years on? as you perceive it? You know, I think probably it's less um, physical. Uh, You know, she's very clear about the room, you know, as in some space that you're actually sitting in, an architectural idea. And, and I actually think maybe for us it's more room for one's own or room, room to have, you know, what you were speaking about at the podium, your mind, um, to have your own mind. Um, uh, I think that's in jeopardy, to, to, to formulate or find or articulate um, your your mind so that and keep it flexible and open so that it's not rigid. Um, so that's a sort of that's a kind of solitude, I guess. So what would that practice look like if if the writer is dependent upon that practice of solitude? If the writer requires that space in which that will occur, how does one maintain that suppleness that allows a response? I don't know. You're writing a novel. How do you do it? 
I wake up early in the morning and I go straight to my desk. <laughs> I mean, that's before the chatter and the noise intrudes upon my own ability to think. Yeah, habits are useful. Um, someone like me, it's difficult because I have really bad habits. Um, what does that mean? You have bad habits. I mean, you have I, nine books of poetry. You have this extraordinary have, collection of thought. I have really bad habits. Uh, Share, won't you? Since we're all pruriently interested in badness, <laughs> what Anne Lauterbach's Bach's badness looks like. No one's here. It's just you and me. You know, I, I used to take, I used to, when I was much younger, I, I kept a journal, and um, uh, in the journal, um, my um, very wicked, sabotaging inner voice constantly talked to me about discipline, constantly. It came up over and over again. You have no discipline. You have no discipline, which I affiliate with habit. I mean, William James is very eloquent on the idea of habit, and, and uh, so I understand that it's a really good thing if you can have good habits. So bad habits are, um, you know, being dissolute and lazy and postponing everything till the very last minute, and finding oneself um, feeling that the world is nothing but an enormous pile of tasks that one can't really distinguish which one should be done first. Um, uh, this does not sound like solitude. No, it's not. It's very busy in there. Uh, so to find the space of solitude that we're talking about, the habit of solitude, the place where you can actually make something, um, for me, it's an extraordinary, laborious process because there have to be all kinds of prior orders uh, put in play before I can actually go to that place. It's time-consuming, actually, to get to that place. You haven't revealed anything too dark here. You, you sound <laughs> all too human in the idea that you have a life that extends beyond your desk no, and but laundry I, but to I, fold but and so I forth. I actually feel that, that I know so many, particularly novelists, maybe not so much poets, who do what, exactly what you do. You know, they have a very daily schedule. It's protected. They do it, and um, even if they... Even if they write two sentences, it's always that time that's protected. And I do think that's uh, essential, actually. Um. Interestingly, you were recently called an intellectual and were <laughs> surprised about it. And you said to me that, that you were surprised to hear the word because it seems to have sort of gone out as an idea, the idea that one would be, as a writer, an intellectual. No, not as a writer, as a poet. It's different. Please distinguish these two <laughs> things. What is the difference in, in your way of thinking between a writer and a poet? Well, you know, there is an institution in New York called Poets and Writers, which has always irritated me. Um, and, um, uh, and not only that, but in the old days when we went to bookstores, guess what? There was a section called Poetry, and then there was a section called Literature. Really? And then, you know. And also fiction, strangely. And fiction. Yeah. Yes. So, so poetry's always been separated out from even this idea of being a writer. And therefore, I think also separated out, not always, but certainly in our recent time, from any sense that we are engaged in public discourse or engaged in the intellectual reality of the world that we live in that we're, we're, we've been consigned to a very strange little minority group that ostensibly never does anything but fight with each other. That's, a, that's the characteristic that's always there. And also constantly the journalists of the world have decided that nobody, nobody but poets reads poetry. So if you're called, as I was recently, by a wonderful friend who is a poet, you're an intellectual and I looked at him and I thought, wow, I haven't heard that word for a long time. Um, um, and, and I thought, is this not a good thing to be a poet and an intellectual or an intellectual poet, which I suppose is really what he was saying. Um, and, um, and so then that word, the public poet, I saw on, on the bags you all have that there's, um, Ben, get off your phone, for goodness sake. That's not nice. Um, um, uh, 
the bag that you all got, or maybe some of us got. Maybe yes, the tote has. bag with yeah, the Auden so quote. There's a, so there's a quote from Auden there. And I think about Auden as, as one of the last uh, poets who had a kind of public voice. Um, that was a long time ago. Um, who addressed uh, public, uh, felt that he could speak on behalf, in a sense, of the public. The idea of I don't a, think that myself. The idea of a poet, though, who would have that role in society is one that is deeply ingrained in your thinking and in your work. Emerson is somebody who you write about a lot and or have written about a lot and is central to the night sky, this, this suite of essays and engagements. And I want to read some Emerson that you quote um, from one of his essays. We dress our garden, eat our dinner, discuss the household with our wives, and these things make no impression or forgotten next week. But in the solitude to which every man is always returning, he has a sanity and revelations which in his passage into new worlds he will carry with him. Never mind the ridicule. Never mind the defeat. Up again, old heart, it seems to say. There is victory yet for all justice, and the true romance which the world exists to realize will be the transformation of genius into practical power. Can you talk a little bit about this idea within the context of poetry, it's, it's your perception of its waning place, and the role that Emerson, central to kind of a thinking about America and what America might be as an idea, you call it a poem in one of the things that you've written. Well, <clears throat> he, is a, he is definitely a guiding figure for me and has been for many years. That passage comes at the very end of his remarkable essay, Experience. Um, and, um, and he's telling himself uh, that up again old heart is his own admi admonition to himself um, because the essay begins, as most of you know probably, with his um, saying that he's incapable of grieving for his son Waldo. Uh, and then as he writes the essay, he finds his way through to, uh, to his loss, actually. And then, um, and then in that remarkable um, uh, enumeration of gradual awakening, he comes to this place of um, of um, this notion of of practical power that comes out of this de this deepest consideration of the fact of, in his case, loss, but then loss turned into a ground of experience that then allows him to go on. Um, and I expect that that, for me, was very, very particularly encouraging. Uh, and I find him um, remarkably subtle and uh, convincing um, in his uh, ability to never be categorical. Um, Emerson's always in, a, in, in this word came up very briefly last night he's always thinking about relation he's always thinking in terms of relation so the place of the category is always in a kind of marvelous syntactical um, um, abridgment or, or shift space so that, um, so that he, gives you, he gives you permission not only to be his in interlocutor, that happens because of that, because of that wonderful um, um, flexibility in his own thinking. So your own thinking is invited to come in, not as a judge, but as a participant almost. So he's had a huge... As experience itself. Yes, as experience. So reading as experience. And so you find yourself in this kind of... Um, uh, which I guess is part of this conversation, the solitude that is involved in reading is of a very particular kind, right? If you're reading and you're in a conversation with... That's why I think Marilyn Robinson is so interesting because she's always in conversation with somebody, so she's not really alone. And, and I think about my house, which is filled with piles of books and, and also some small artworks, 
And I always think that they're talking to each other. And I have this kind of weird notion that if I put Nietzsche next to... Mm, who would I put Nietzsche next to that they can talk to, you know? And I had this kind of funny way. They're busy conversing. It's very, you know... And of weird. course they are. And of course they are. Yesterday, the architect Hans was talking about the way in which when we lose a house, say, what we're losing isn't a piece, isn't a structure. It isn't the thing itself which can be rebuilt, but rather it's contents that are carefully curated and chosen by the person who lives there. That loss of something a grandmother gave you of which you have one... Right. You know, right. That loss, that sense of putting things in relation is something we do naturally as human beings. We curate our lives, perhaps not even self-consciously, just simply conscious of self. The idea that right. this pleases me, this means something to me. I've created something here which right. I can live in, right. a life that you can live in. One of the things that interests me... Let so, me just introduce yeah, you, please. just for one second, because you reminded me of Robert Creeley um, and the poet Robert Creeley, uh, who always used this word company. And, and I always found that a very wonderful word. He was always thinking about the company. Uh, and in a sense, what we're talking not about Google, now. But yeah. Yeah. What? Not Google. No. No. Yeah. Go on. Moving Sorry. on. Go well, ahead. the question I have then is about forms, because one of the things that you do so well in your writing is you forge new forms in which uh, relation, in which combination actually becomes very meaningful. That is to say that there isn't a recurrence of, say, the villanelle in your work. <laughs> Rather, there is a recurrence Because like I don't know how to do it. <laughs> well, but you, you do then know how to do other things which you have been, it seems to me, doing to the, to the benefit of the reader who could then be put in relation to a, uh, something, an experience which is new in writing. I mean, we've got thousands of years of poetry uh, in the West from Homer forward, and some of those expressions in poetry are in forms that are very known to us and dependable, but you've forged a lot of forms which are, it seems to me, new as a function of the time you spend in solitude. Can you speak a little bit about what the poet's job, if no longer in the public square, the poet you know, takes that prominent Emersonian or Auden-like role? What is, the, what, is the, what is the role of that formal innovation in attempting to reach another reader in that private space where reading happens? It's a really complicated and wonderful question. It's compli complicated for me to answer it. Um, I think the reason poetry is something that we should still think about is that poets are, are if, if you have a, if you have a, te a, tec a, techne a, a technical interest or field, for poets it's actually um, the micro workings of language, not the macro workings of language. So we're interested, or at least I'm interested, in, um, for example, the amazing parade of prepositions that tell us lots about relation, more than verbs do, more than, certainly more than adverbs. Prepositions are astonishing. I mean, Gertrude Stein picked them out too, so this is not original with me. But in English, they're s super important because the way in which one object is in relation to another in space and in time is all connected by the prepositional moment or the syntactical moment of the preposition. So that's of, on, to, with, before, after, uh, under, over. I mean, it's a sort of amazing um, uh, scaffold. So I think we're interested in that. And I think, um, for me personally, what you're very flatteringly calling new form, um, what I came to some years ago was this notion of a whole fragment, which was a different thing from the 
modernist fragment, which meant that the holes had been lost and everything, you know, these fragments I've shored against my ruins, says Elliot. So I thought, oh, well, okay, so there's that fragment that was because we've lost this idea of entirety or wholeness, but there's another fragment that's more interesting to me, which is the fragment of the present, let's say. Um, this is, we're having a fragment now, and you'll go off and you'll have a all the people in this room will have memories of what happened here, even if they can check it by re- looking at the recording. But let's just say it's their memory. And then you have your memory, and I have my memory. And those, are, those memories get attached to other things. So, um, and you take out one piece of it with you, and I take another piece. I don't take the whole thing, because I can't. And everybody else takes their piece, and those are fragments too. So out of the way in which we all conduct our lives, there are these things that attach. And, um, and I don't feel that I have the right <laughs> to, um, to um, uh, tell people what they should attach to. So my poems often have this kind of fragmentary feel to them, but it's really about giving permission to people to make their own sentences almost out of them or their own paragraphs or their own memories. You know, I, I like it when people just take a little phrase and go, I, I actually have this sort of, it's like picking a flower out of a garden, you know, and then you just go off with the flower and that's your flower. And I don't care if they don't have the whole garden. I actually don't want them to have the whole garden. It's my garden. You see, it's sort of interesting kind of weird thing. Strangely, this makes me think of Snowden. Oh, good. With whom you will be speaking in a little while. In that, one of the things that President Obama, and you should, if you haven't yet, go to the New York Review of Books and read Marilyn Robinson's conversation with our president, the first part. So she is in conversation in her work, but she's also... He, he called her my friend the other day. I was very jealous. He, he did. He did indeed. And apparently, yes, that friendship we're now going to watch unfold in public as their conversations are disseminated on iTunes now, which is just weird and wonderful. But Obama suggested that, that if I understand this right, and there are more people here who know this uh, stuff better than I do, that perhaps Snowden's um, leak was less meaningful than we might make it by virtue of it being metadata. The idea that it's this huge amount of information that's unparsable. That is to say, there's no selection. There's no com- company to it. There's nothing you can take, no single flower you could pull from that field because you can't reach any of it. It's too vast. And it seems to me that this question of the idea of privacy and the question of what a, a person who's attempting to make sense of the world through showing us the secrets of the world versus a writer who with incredible care is trying to select from all of that for us is a very different way perhaps of of thinking about what it is one means when one talks about having some sort of meaningful exchange with the world or speaking truth in the world. The life of the writer, it seems to me, suggests for each of us as readers that we are fundamentally and safely private in a way that when we turn the lens outward and we're terrified by all the lenses turned on us may not be the conversation. But the art, but the art will work. The work of art, as I try to say in the opening remarks, is, is, is a work of interpretation, right? It's not about me, and in it, but it is about my relation to world, what I call worldness. So worldness, you worldness, said. Okay. Yeah, that I, I, I think that language does that constantly, right? Makes some kind of, makes a relation between a given self and a given world. That's what the, that's what the deal is. Um, and so, when you go from your private reckoning of a self to a world, and you make something, and then you put it in the world, it's in order for other people to have. Um, uh, some acquaintance maybe with your relation to it, but also their relation to it. I think there's a kind of analogous space that ought to open up in in our encounters with particularly written work that we that we that we are allowed we're in the company you know we become empowered by 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 knowing what that looks like or the shape of it or the form of it whatever way you want to talk about that. 
I don't know that I'm answering your question. I mean, I think with, with the Snowden um, uh, analogy, um, I don't think that the information is at all interesting uh, or we should even be preoccupied with it unless um, there is some harm that's been done by its... It, no, the, the, the gesture that is important is that he decided to let the world know, our world know, and the world know, that some things were happening that ought not to be happening. It's that act that's important. Which relates to what you said in your remarks of the difference between information and knowledge. Yeah. We have a lot of information. How do we parse through it to find what might be meaningful, what might be knowledge? And one of your activities, in addition to poet and essayist, is teacher. And you began teaching in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, when John Ashbery fell ill and you took over his class. Is that right? That's true, yes. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your understanding of the difference of the space of a classroom as a, some kind of public space, which also has a certain degree of privacy and, and privilege to it, and the way in which we, as people at a college, um, might understand the value of that space in the life of the reader and the writer as we try to move from information to knowledge. Wow, that's a very... I'll ask it a different way just because I know you told me you took an incredible class in college that was so memorable to you that was about the Bible and Shakespeare. And when you talk about this class, it's as though you just left it five minutes earlier. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, it was taught, I went to the University of Wisconsin and it was taught by, a, a, there were two different classes. Uh, her name is Madeline Doran and she was a Shakespearean and she also was somebody who knew uh, just about everything there was to know about uh, the Bible, and um, uh, or as they like to say, the Bible as literature. Um, and um, I, in both cases in her class, um, I learned what the meaning of close reading is. So suddenly um, the impact in both cases was in order, it was my, in, I think what happened is that I understood that, oh, oh, there's an attention to language that is of a very particular kind, <laughs> and um, and it's and that kind has to do with uh, the discerning of um, a very elaborated or intricate. I think that's it. Uh, there was sort of an intricacy to the way in which both Shakespeare and the Bible go about um, um, uh, transferring. Uh, information as knowledge, so that was where that was where it it began. That and, a, and an amazing course in American intellectual history, which I didn't know existed until I got there. I thought, oh, there's actually a history of American. How fascinating! Um, uh, so um, I think that what I've come down to, all right, I have a confession. Along with bad, bad habits, I feel I have very little information. I think I'm actually quite an ignorant person, and I think that I'm, um, and I have a very hard time. Con this is goes. This is not just because I'm getting old. It's because forever I can't actually retrieve uh, a pure information. It has to be some Phone numbers. I mean, are we talking prosaic details or uh, text? Just, just you know, just you know, the names of things related to the dates of things related to the. To the, there's a whole world of information that's attached to actually to literature that I'm very very bad at, um, and I have I can only come to these places by association or contextualization. So as a result of my feeling that I am really ignorant, um, I I figured out that I had some other things that I could maybe convey or help happen <laughs> in a class. Uh, and that would be what I've come rather pretentiously to call causing thinking, you know, causing people to think. Um, so that's like a, an idea of provocation or an idea of um, what does it mean to think about this, you know, actually bringing attention to that, that thing itself. It's sort, of, it's sort of a meta space in a way. Well, that's, that's different, as you say, the difference between interpretation and critique. Because one of the impulses I think that we all have very spontaneously is to judge 
things, to say this is right, that's wrong, right. this is good, that's bad. Right. But the criteria by which we might end up doing that is often elusive to us. We feel it strongly, but we may not be able to articulate that thing. So in terms of causing thinking, what is, about, what is it about a classroom that can provide that space which allows such a thing to occur? That perhaps is different, and I would conceive of it potentially as a private space, different from a public space, or some sort of transitional space between private and public, because we all know very well and are perhaps tired of hearing just how badly we do in public about attempting to talk about difficult things. Well, Emerson said wonderfully a couple of things. One, he, one he said, this is remembered always, uh, a foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of small minds. So I'm not consistent, and as a result, I offer to um, my classes um, too much, like excess. I'm very excessive. Uh, I give them more than they can possibly actually, you know, comprehend or read deliberately. Um, and Overwhelming, then, in yeah, other words. a little bit. You know, like read all of this if you can. I always say if you can, and then I also give them. Um, texts that are not necessarily totally congruent with each other or with even the subject. So there's a sort of idea of the disparate. And I think when you're faced with the disparate as opposed to the same, you have to think <laughs> because you have to find a way to make that and that. Somehow you have to fill this space between. Um, and so I think that's a kind of method, a kind of, I don't recommend it, um, but it is a kind of methodology that um, sometimes really works because the people who are excited about the idea that they're being per permitted to make relations, again, uh, between and among uh, various uh, uh, diverse texts, um, uh, then I think something happens there that's, um, that can be useful. And I also make them write a lot, um, uh, which, um, and I ask them to, I mean, this is a little too particular, but to select out quotations and then write about those quotations so that they begin to have, feel that they have some right to, uh, to, to form these relations directly rather than indirectly. Does and that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's putting them essentially in the company of things that they then have to right. introduce themselves to in some right. fundamental way. Right. Okay. Um, I think we've come to the moment when we can open this up to having a more companionable session where you will ask questions of Anne. So might we pass along the microphones through the or room and, and do so? Great. So uh, yes, there's a mic that's, that's moving through. Um, I, I thought the the question about the classroom as private and public space was very interesting, and I'd like to extend that to this room, um, to the auditorium, stage, speakers, audience, which is, I'd like you to respond to this. At the beginning, you reprimanded someone for using a device. And some people, I think, in the room took that as a, you know, a assertion of good old politeness, a certain culture. And I've spent a lot of time since then thinking about the question of, are we in the audience entitled to a certain privacy that you, because of the invisible scrim, are not allowed to comment upon? Would you comment upon someone dozing and wake them up in the assertion of this is impolite? And to what extent uh, are you aware as presenters, I mean, I've, I've been on both sides of that, of the idea that, you know, we're your captive audience, are we entitled, since we can't easily leave if we want to, are we entitled to our privacy? Is this a question of, of public and private, of way this goes down? I'd like your comment on that. I would love to assert that I feel far more captive than you do, sir, in that if I were to walk off now, it would be a travesty or a delight for, for certain members of the audience, whereas if you were to go, I, I wouldn't notice. And I would be very Which upset. is only a difference in number, right? Um, but in terms of this question of perhaps propriety and the way in which we would navigate a space in common, the question of whether or not we owe each other any sort of special um, behaviors or rights. In, I think, 
I mean, I, I would say that in my limited life on this planet of 46 years, I have seen that culture change. And someone like Sherry Turkle is probably our most um, articulate advocate in print about the changing ways in which um, civic behavior and technology um, are, are deeply at odds. Jonathan Franzen had an essay on the cover of the book review about Turkle's most recent book on this, her subject which is the way in which technology changes the way that we occupy a civic space. I think inevitably the answer is it does. And the question is, what do we do about it? And sometimes the answer is as simple as, pardon me, may I have your attention? Which could be seen as rude, but it also could be seen as fair. And that would be then something that one could discuss as you raise it to us to discuss. So I thank you for that. Yeah, I think it goes to that first question you asked me about um, reception. Um, uh, one is one is chastises not because one thinks everything one's saying is interesting or important or useful, but that um, it it's it's depressing to think that there are other things that. That, that that whomever doesn't doesn't actually isn't going to wait around to find out whether it's any of those things, but because there's more pressing or more interesting or whatever things on their agenda. So we have these private agendas that seem to make this public space much more jeopardized, uh, and I think that's too bad. I think it's. Um, um, worrying, and it's true that when when my students begin to yawn. I get or very, sleep. Or I mean, sleep. Yeah. I feel very sad. Because it's the most human thing in the world. But sometimes one is very tired and it has nothing to do with anyone. Yes, we have another question uh, from the floor. Yeah, speaking as a fellow metaphorist, um, I have a couple of questions about metaphor, for e one for each of you. Um, I'll start with our special guest here. I was very impressed with the poem about receptivity. And I'll tell you, I had a jolt when uh, you mentioned, when, when the line of the telescope. Because to me, that just struck me as a metaphor that seemed as if you were declaring, and you can correct me, that, that a sense of empowerment within your zone of isolation and solitude that the telescope meant that you're not passive and that you can reach for your receptivity in any direction you want. And it's certainly not hostile to modernity. And I'll follow this up with a question with, to, for Wyatt. I mean, am I on target there? Because I found it very striking. Shall I read the lines again so that we have them before us? Is that worthwhile? Okay. So this is uh, Anne's response to the Mallarmé passage. But it's not a poem, it's prose. It's prose, yes. Um, there are times, this being one, late November, everything, from air to hair turning gray when a person wants to withdraw into a steady state of reception, to become as mutely supple as a telescope scanning the night sky. Well, I found it very related to the notion of this conference that privacy can be empowering and a place from which you can reach out. But, but, but I'm talking too much. I'd like to hear your response. Uh, you know, I think that's lovely and right and, um, and accurate. Uh, and the fact that um, this telescope came into my head then um, is, is also kind of interesting, except for that um, it probably came into my head uh, just to be m momentar for a moment autobiographical biographical is when I was quite young, like 16, um, my mother drove us west and we visited some people in um, Salt Lake City and the son of these people, uh, he was a journalist and the son was a budding, actually he turned into a phys physicist, but he had in the backyard a telescope. And um, and I got to look through the telescope and see the rings of Saturn way before Zabald uh, even, I think, had written his book. Um, and um, uh, this astonished me, this possibility of, of worlds be beyond worlds. Uh, and I think that um, 
that metaphor is a kind of um, uh, the other thing to say is that I think that I think spatially so so the world comes to me as a series of spaces as opposed to temporally I think I have a very strong spatial um, imagination so worldness to me is is very connected to the idea of space you know in the in the most profound sense of space that that's so cool um, the <laughs> The, the other thing connects to my question for Wyatt, and that is that, you know, we were talking about people being distracted in the audience and whether that's their right. And I certainly grant Wyatt's right to have been distracted during my talk yesterday and ignored everything of the meaning rather than just zeroing in on a metaphor of the eyeball. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I, you have a right to daydream both before and after the metaphor that struck you. I'm not sure that was a question. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But you're welcome to respond. I think choosing something that strikes one, or not being able to choose otherwise because one is struck, is different from ignoring. And so that was something I noticed, and that made me think of something, which ideally is what a talk might do, make you think of something, which then you would respond to, which is all I was trying to do. Another question or comment. So it's lady down back there. And a student voice would always be welcome, not to say that we don't welcome non-student voices. All voices welcome. Um, I had a question for Anne about your statement that Auden, I think you said, was one of the last poets to speak on behalf of the public. And I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit in relation to um, my thinking about whether it depends upon what public you have in mind. For example, is Anne Sexton addressing the public? Is Sandra Cisneros addressing the public? Um, Evan Boland, who writes about this in her exploration of what it means to talk about women's poetry and the public. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a good corrective question. I'm thinking about uh, Claudia Rankine's extraordinary book that came out last year called Citizen, which was clearly addressing um, the public, uh, our public, our particular public. Um, I think that the... So, so I think my comment was much more about reception than it was about what poets want to do. I think almost all the poets I love want to engage a public and a public beyond their um, coterie. Uh, so I, I may have misspoken because I think what I meant was Auden was one of, one of the last poets who was given permission to be considered um, a public voice, to have a voice uh, which one, uh, you know, after 9-11, his poem, uh, September 1st, 1939, was widely, widely um, quoted, uh, re-quoted, as it were. Um, and, um, uh, and it starts with, you know, I sit in a dive on 57th Street and uh, a low, dishonest decade. And... Um, so there's this incredible sense that he's um, the single person, but he is in this, in this world that he's aware of, uh, a very particular kind of political world. Um, so there, so that, I'm only, so Auden comes to mind, one, that he's on that, on our bag, you know, and I'm thinking, why is Auden on this bag and not somebody since Auden? It's sort of interesting to me. Um, although I think that he's uh, in the same um, um, time frame as Arendt, so that's probably one reason anyway. Um, so I'm drifting here, but I, th but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the poets, poets who write want to write into the public or for the public, um, not for themselves. But, the, but mostly journalism has decided that it is an irrelevant and uninteresting form. And, and I've, just to say one further thing, the way in which I've characterized the reason for this is that I think that we are now in a culture in which there are two things that, that preoccupy our public imagination. One is 
information, qua information, and the other is entertainment. And poetry doesn't do either, really. It neither conveys information as information, nor does it particularly entertain. It can, but it doesn't always. Or it entertains differently from the way one might construe what entertainment is. So it falls into this place that just doesn't um, have enough traction in the, in the public imagination. And maybe at another mi- moment it might again. You never know. As we move to the next question, I'll just say that entertainment is an interesting word in that its etymology uh, roots back to the idea of being held, and so held in the sense of captivate. And so poetry certainly has that power to to hold our attention and to captivate us, albeit not necessarily through the narrative strategies that are more common in what we see as entertainment today. Uh, Another question, perhaps from a student if we have it, or... uh, that person Where's might the, be a student yeah. back there. <laughs> Is the microphone moving? Yes, in the back on the stage. Right. Oh, I think that might be Matt. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering, uh, you talked about uh, how the writer is kind of dependent on this environment of solitude. And, um, but you also kind of talked about how there's this very like uh, public part where it it comes out and you introduce it to the public, your own writing. And so I was wondering how you kind of make this leap, this leap from the kind of private sphere to the public sphere, and if it's something that's kind of out of necessity um, or just kind of how it makes that leap. It's interesting you think of it as a leap. Um, I suddenly had this picture of poems leaping. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Bye, bye, good luck. Um, uh, well, I, the, I, I'm not quite sure, Matt, what the question is. Uh, I guess there's a thing called publication. And, um, and then the prayer that when the poem is, is pub, published, either on the web or in a book or in a magazine, that, that it begins its journey into its public life. Um, uh, and what's interesting about that is that then you have no jurisdiction over it whatsoever. And I actually love that feeling of, of the departure, you know. Um, although when I finish a book, I often feel quite sad, uh, you know, that it's a kind of, um, it's the way I think parents feel when their kids go to college, you know, like, oh, well, mm. Uh, good luck. Have a good time. Hope you meet some nice people. <laughs> How do you, as a poet, like decide to take it out of the private sphere? And like, I mean, it can it seem like tempting to keep it as this insular thought that you don't share with anyone? How do you decide that? Oh, I'm going to share these thoughts with uh, the public around me. I think that, that's what I was trying to get at. I don't think it's a decision. I think that, I mean, they might be thinking about, about, hmm. You form a relation as a writer with what you're writing. It's a very particular, I guess you could call it a private relationship, right? Um, and in my case, I like to think that the thing that I'm making has its, has its actually, has a certain amount of agency. It has certain kinds of demands it makes on me, not just me, on it. So that is already a kind of um, reciprocity. Um, and the, the, it isn't even, if the question is about when do you know that the poem is finished, that's one way of thinking about, well, now it can go into a public space. Um, there are all kinds of ways, but I don't think it's a, it, I don't think, I'm not sure the, where, the, where you're asking the question, whether it's in the writing of the poem, thinking about publicness, or whether it is putting the poem into the world, um, uh, or whether it's about how does the world get into the poem, which is a complicated kind of question. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I'm quite, I don't think there's a decision involved here other than the decision to, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to send this out now into the world.
or even just read it in public, which is a different kind of, a, a, a more exciting kind of thing to happen. I think we have several hands on this side of the room that haven't been reached. Hi, Anne. I'd like to extrapolate on the question of writing for the public and ask about writing in public. And I'm wondering if you've ever got the sensation writing in public that someone's peering over your shoulder and watching you write, and I'm wondering if that changes anything for the process of writing. You mean physically, say, at a cafe table and somebody is surveilling yes, you? exactly. Okay. Do you write in public, Anne? Um, well, I... I jot things down in public. Um, I like taking notes. So, but I don't actually compose in public, although I was thinking about this last night when I was thinking about this moment, and I happen to know that one of our dear colleagues who writes, um, not poems, but quite extraordinary books, Daniel Mendelssohn, he likes to go to, um, to Murray's in Tivoli and uh, write. Um, and seems um, very happy to do that. So I think um, um, I think it all depends on on your kind of temperament <laughs> and and how you construe the notion of how much solitude you need to write. Um, uh, I like to think of myself generally as a scanner. It's one of my favorite kind of self images. You know that I'm sca I'm constantly scanning. Uh, and the, in the scansion, in the scanning, um, I'm trying to f find um, things that might adhere <laughs> to the poem. So little, little pieces of this and that and this and that, little overheard things or things I see, I, I try and kind of pull them in. Um, they can come from any direction at all. But I, I have no worry about anybody looking over my shoulder or, you know, I don't think anybody really wants to be noting anything that I'm writing down. The mic on the side of the room, there are several hands. We can seek them out. Yeah. Um, well, we talked a lot about uh, privacy being important for the writer, but um, we've only touched on how publicity is important for the writer. You talked about how Auden is the one of the last important public poets. Um, I mean, yeah, privacy is important for the writer to retreat and to think, but it also you also need a public who can receive, right? Who can. <laughs> so it's not. I don't really have a question so much as mulling over something problematic, right? Like. What, how can you be a writer when there's not an audience? Um, it's a very profound and uh, difficult question, or the answer is, pro is not profound but difficult. Uh, it is very hard to write, especially with my particular temperament, thinking that um, basically very, very, very few reviewers are interested in reviewing the next book by Anne Lauderback. Um, and so if publicity is what you're talking about, which is, you know, how does this book reach anybody and why should it? And what, um, it's, uh, you just go on a kind of whim and a prayer, I think, some kind of, some kind of prayer space and hope that, um, that uh, there are enough single people, uh, single figures uh, out there who happen to come across a book and then find their way. The publishing houses mostly, the ones, especially my publishing house, which is a very big one, it's Penguin that's now Penguin Random House. I'm happy to tell you that I just got the first royalty statement. Um, they've kept most of my books in print, so I got, uh, I get a very many pages I think random is, has ginned up the the um, 
the paper making of the royalty statements. So you, I often don't even open them because I because they say you know you sold two copies of this one and three copies of this one. So I don't look. But this one I opened because it was sort of fat, and I thought, hmm, who knows? <laughs> and, and indeed, there was a check <laughs> in this pile of paper for $17. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to spend it. Something wonderful. <laughs> Just to address this idea of how a writer can actually reach readers, I mean, what does a reader want more than anything? And that's something wonderful to read. And we all define this differently. And as somebody who uh, I write reviews of, 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 of books that, that I do out of almost always the love of a particular book that's come across my desk, either something I've happened upon or somebody thought to send me because they thought, I think you'll really like this. And I think if we imagine that there's a very optimistic, however small, culture of readers who actually do, readers who do want to discover things that will in some way electrify them and move them and, and, and move them to want to think and write and be and all those things that are virtuous and good. Writing something meaningful uh, is the only guarantor of publicity, if, if you see what I'm, I'm saying. And it actually is quite successful. And there, a good example of this is a, a, of the young uh, poet and novelist and essayist Ben Lerner, who wrote three collections of poetry, which were quite well regarded and little read within the larger precincts of the culture. He wrote a novel that was published by a small, virtuous publishing house that often publishes poetry, Coffee House Press. It was published in paperback. And that was because it could not be published by, could not is not the right word, would not, was not, was rejected by all the major publishing houses. And hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, of writers got behind this book because they loved it. And so all these big names threw themselves at the book and said, hey, 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 read this thing. And a lot of people came to read not just this novel, but his next novel and his essays and his poems by virtue of love. And so I think good writing uh, garners that regularly. I see it, and so it's encouraging. We have, we have another question down front from I Professor I would just Kahn. like to yeah. say that, that in the case of Ben Lerner, those of us who are poets read his poetry, and he actually read here um, about six or seven years ago before he began writing uh, novels. So um, I just... It, 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 I, I did the, the postscript to this is if you think about numbers you're ruined. So you just can't think about numbers. You can't think about how many. You can only think about sp specificities. So a question down front here, if we could. Thank you. From, yeah. There's a mic coming to you. It's here. I have a, a, a remark and a question to uh, Ms. Lauterbach. And that is, I, I was very taken with it when you mentioned Auden's poem about... Uh, 1939 that, that he wrote and and I, I just wondered this is really not a question but it made me think uh, he disowned that poem as, as I'm sure you know he said the, the last two lines are we must love one another or die he said we must die anyway then he went through it tried to correct it and said the whole thing is dishonest and expurgated it from any other edition of his poetry but it would be very interesting to think what he might have thought of that after 2001. That's, that's not my... What I really was taken with was your discussion of solitude. And um, it, it, because it, it does seem to me, I agree, I, I, if you agree, um, that it is one of the last refuges refuge of, of privacy, actually, in, in, in solitude. I was particularly taken with what you said was a re refer referred to as receptivity in solitude. And I, uh, I mean, solitude is, is a word, a, a wonderful word, a beautiful word, I think, but it, it, it has had predecessors like contemplation where people thought, well, they were receiving, it was a platonic idea, a realer thing than anything here or the uh, lumen naturalis, the, the, the source of natural law. 
you will, natural light shine, shining down. Then it in the Middle Ages it became meditation. And now meditation, that was the voice of God you heard in your conscience. And now meditation means virtually anything. So uh, solitude is the great word, the, the, real, the real one, I think. When you mentioned receptivity, I wanted to ask you about what, what you consider the source, what you are receiving, in, in it, where, where it, it comes from. I, I, I quite understand what you mean. I think thinking is, it, it, and solid, solitary thinking is, is, is an activity where something is going on, but I'm unclear where you might say the source of what you receive might be. The source of what I receive, the source, I don't know. I don't think I think about sources. Um, the source is apprentice. Uh, that was a sort of joke. Um, you know, I think that um, along with thinking of myself as a scanner, I think of myself as a starer. I like to stare. Um, and um, staring, I think, is related to um, seeing uh, or watching the light. So I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to say, just for the sake of the fact that you would like a source, that the source of my solitude is light, and and um, and the way in which light alters uh, the world. Um, yeah. And we'll leave it there. Thank you for attending this first panel, and we'll continue with the day.